Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to SNAP Inc.'s second quarter 2018 earnings call. At this time, participants are in a listen-only mode. After the prepared remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. This call will be recorded. Thank you very much. Mr. Armand Panjwani, Investor Relations, you may begin. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to SNAP Inc.'s second quarter 2018 earnings conference call. With us today are Evan Spiegel, CEO and co-founder, Imran Khan, Chief Strategy Officer, Tim Stone, CFO, and Kristen Southey, our new VP of Investor Relations. Please note that the format of this call will be slightly different than the calls we have hosted previously. To allow more time for questions, Evan will provide a brief strategic update and Tim will provide a brief business overview and financial outlook for Q3 2018 before we open the line for Q&A. We have also included additional supplemental financial information and business metrics for reference in our press release. Earlier today, we made a slide presentation available that provides an overview of our user and financial metrics for the second quarter of 2018, which can be found on our Investor Relations website. Now I will quickly cover the safe harbor. Today's call is to provide you with information regarding our second quarter 2018 performance in addition to our financial outlook. This conference call includes forward-looking statements. Any statement that refers to expectations, projections, guidance, or other characterizations of future events, including financial projections or future market conditions, is a forward-looking statement based on assumptions today. Actual results may differ materially from those expressed in these forward-looking statements, and we make no obligation to update our disclosures. For more information about factors that may cause actual results to differ materially from forward-looking statements, please refer to the press release we issued today, as well as risks described in our quarterly report on Form 10-Q for the quarter ended March 31, 2018, particularly in the section titled Risk Factors. This information can be found in our other filings with the SEC when available. Our commentary today will also include non-GAAP financial measures. We believe that the use of these non-GAAP financial measures provides an additional tool for investors to use in evaluating ongoing operating results and trends. These measures should not be considered in isolation from or as a substitute for financial information prepared in accordance with GAAP. Reconciliations between GAAP and non-GAAP metrics for our reported results can be found in our press release issued today, a copy of which can be found on our website at investor.snap.com. Please note that when we discuss all of our expense figures, they will exclude stock-based compensation and related payroll taxes, as well as depreciation and amortization and non-recurring charges. At times in our prepared remarks or in response to questions, we may offer additional metrics to provide greater insight into our business or our quarterly and annual results. This additional detail may be one time in nature and we may or may not provide an update in the future on these metrics. Please refer to our filings with the SEC to understand how we calculate our metrics. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Evan. Hi everyone and welcome to our Q2 earnings call. I'm really excited by the progress we've been making at SNAP, and I'm optimistic about the opportunities ahead as we continue to improve our team, reinforce our culture, and invest in innovation. We have focused a lot of our time and effort this past year on developing our team, culture, and leadership that we need to rapidly scale our business. Our team is passionate about our mission to contribute to human progress by empowering people to express themselves, live in the moment, learn about the world, and have fun together and we've redesigned our performance management processes to incorporate our values of being kind, smart, and creative. For us, it's not just about the work that we do, it's about the way that we do it, and we've worked hard to make sure that this positive attitude is reflected across our company. It has been so exciting to watch our team rise to the challenge of building a public company while continuing to innovate and drive long-term value. Our team is much stronger today than it has ever been before. While our monthly active users continued to grow this quarter, we saw a 2% decline in our daily active users. This was primarily driven by a slightly lower frequency of use among our user base due to the disruption caused by our redesign. It has been approximately six months since we broadly rolled out the redesign of our application, and we have been working hard to iterate and improve Snapchat based on the feedback from our community. We feel that we have now addressed the biggest frustrations we've heard and are eager to make more progress on the tremendous opportunity we now have to show more of the right content to the right people. 
For example, the number of people that watch publisher stories and shows on iOS every day has grown by more than 15% this year, and we are excited to bring the learnings from our iterations on iOS to our Android application. Additionally, more snaps from publisher stories and shows were viewed in July than any other month in our history. With the updated redesign, we've been able to combine the strength of our close friend network that brings people to Snapchat every day with an infinite scroll of personalized content. We're working hard to expand the long tail of our content offering, and we are making steady progress on improving personalization. Despite our DAE results this quarter, we believe that this is an important evolution of our product that will help drive future growth and engagement. Our users continue to spend an average of over 30 minutes on Snapchat on a daily basis, and we are already starting to see meaningful improvements in leading growth indicators like new user retention. For example, new user retention for people older than 35 has increased more than 8% since we launched the redesign. We want Snapchat to work well everywhere for everyone, no matter the device or network, and we've been focused on improving the quality of our application on lower-end devices and partnering with carriers to make Snapchat more accessible for everyone. New Snapchat users are predominantly using Android, and we've been working for over a year to completely rewrite our Android application. Even though our iterative efforts to improve the existing application have helped increase new user retention on Android by nearly 20% since Q4 of 2016, we believe that rewriting the application presents a big opportunity because it takes advantage of the latest Android capabilities and has a modularized structure that will make it easier for us to innovate in the future. Our internal tests in our device lab show substantial improvements in important application performance metrics, like the time it takes to open Snapchat and create a snap, and we are beginning to test a limited version with beta users in select countries. Augmented reality continues to be a massive long-term opportunity for us, and we recently started rolling out Lens Explorer that allows users to browse thousands of lenses built by our community using Lens Studio. Lens Explorer celebrates the ingenuity of our community and increases the creative power of the Snapchat camera. We also release Snappables, new augmented reality experiences that can be shared with friends. Snappables help reduce the friction from self-expression, and they're a ton of fun to use together. For example, Selfie Mix, one of our first Snappables, was used to create over 300 million snaps. We're really excited about the progress we are making with Spectacles, our sunglasses that snap. We released a new version of Spectacles this quarter, and we are learning a lot as we continue to iterate based on customer feedback. When combined with our efforts in augmented reality, we believe spectacles represent an exciting opportunity as we build towards a future where computing is overlaid on the world. It has been almost two years since we began the transition to programmatic advertising, and our team has moved quickly to build out advanced targeting, measurement, goal-based bidding, near real-time analytics and insights, and so much more. All of this has resulted in lower cost per impression, cost per swipe, and cost per install for advertisers while simultaneously growing our advertising revenue 48% year over year. Our advertising is now cost effective, easy to buy, and easy to measure. This has removed friction from our advertising business and allowed us to scale to many more advertisers than we could have reached with our direct sales force. Even though this transition wasn't easy, it was the right thing to do for our business over the long term, even at the expense of short-term revenue growth. These are the types of opportunities that inspire our team and play to our strengths because they require strong conviction and a belief in the long term. I'm really proud of the progress we're making towards building a sustainable business and generating free cash flow. We feel good about our cash position as we move forward and scale our business. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce Tim Stone. He has brought a wealth of operational experience and a new perspective to our business, and we are grateful to have him on our team. I'm going to turn the call over to Tim to share more about the progress that we are making. Thanks, Evan. Our second quarter financial results reflect our focus on growth and operational efficiencies. Q2 2018 operating cash flow was negative $199 million, an improvement of $10 million compared with Q2 2017, and an improvement of $33 million compared with Q1 2018. The year-over-year -year change in operating cash flow is driven by a $25 million improvement in adjusted EBITDA, offset by changes in the timing of working capital. Similarly, the sequential change in operating cash flow is driven by a $49 million improvement in adjusted EBITDA, Again, offset by changes in the timing of working capital. Q2 2018 capital expenditures were $35 million, up from $19 million in Q2 2017 and down from $36 million in Q1 2018. As a reminder, the substantial majority of our capital expenditures are associated with office facilities. The additional capital expenditures this year are related to the build-out of our leased Santa Monica office facilities, which we expect to moderate over the next several quarters. Q2 2018 free cash flow was negative $234 million, a decline of $5 million compared with Q2 2017, 
and an improvement of $34 million compared to Q1 2018. As a result of our relatively low capital expenditures, we should see strong adjusted EBITDA to free cash flow conversion over time. Common shares outstanding, plus shares underlying stock-based awards outstanding, totaled roughly $1.5 billion on June 30, 2018, compared with $1.4 billion a year ago. Q2 2018 DAUs were $188 million, up 8% from $173 million in Q2 2017, and down from $191 million in Q1 2018. North America DAU were $80 million, up 7% from $75 million in Q2 2017, and down from $81 million in Q1 2018. Total revenue for the quarter was $262 million, an increase of 44% year-over-year and 14% sequentially. And our trailing 12-month revenue was $987 million, up 58% year-over-year. International countries represented 32% of total revenue, up from 19% in Q2 2017 and 26% in Q1 2018. As a reminder, we define international as revenue apportioned to countries outside of North America. ARPU increased to $1.40, an improvement of 34% year-over-year and 16% sequentially. Advertising revenue for the quarter was $260 million, an increase of 48% year-over-year and 14% sequentially, driven by traction in our global online sales business, which includes SMBs and sales partners, and strong growth in international countries. Impressions were up 191% year-over-year and 26% sequentially. Pricing was down 52% year-over-year and 9% sequentially. It's also interesting to look back two years before a shift to programmatic. Advertising revenue has increased more than 2.5 times from $72 million in Q2 2016, and pricing is down over 90%. Approximately 75% of our advertising revenue was transacted programmatically this quarter, compared to 18% in Q2 2017. Programmatic advertising revenue grew 485% year-over-year and 34% sequentially, driven by the transition of all ad formats to our programmatic marketplace, traction in our global online sales business, and strength in international countries. Programmatic impressions were up 722% year-over-year and 47% sequentially, while pricing was down 29% year-over-year and down 9% sequentially. These results exclude our on-demand geofilters product and minimum guarantees. We will continue to transition our creative tools business to the programmatic platform throughout 2018. Cost of revenue was $184 million, an increase of 26% year-over-year and a decrease of 4% sequentially. Infrastructure costs were $136 million, an increase of 28% year-over-year and a decrease of 2% sequentially. We are focused on driving operational efficiencies and improving the unit economics of our multi-cloud environment as we scale over time. Additionally, our model benefits from our cloud partners' continuous investments in technology innovation and cost efficiencies, which are typically passed along to customers over time. The cost of our infrastructure model are included in EBITDA, as opposed to capital expenditures, which should result in higher EBITDA to free cash flow conversion over time. This year, we have seen several million dollars in cloud unit cost reductions and tens of millions of dollars in engineering operating efficiency. These improvements in our cost structure resulted in leveraging our infrastructure in Q2 2018, and we will remain focused on operating efficiencies and unit cost economics over the long term. Operating expenses were $247 million, up 8% year-over-year, and down 4% sequentially. We continue to focus on driving operating cost productivity across our business. Our operating expenses are primarily driven by labor costs, which represent about 60% of operating expenses excluding stock-based compensation and related payroll taxes. We saw fixed cost leverage and people costs, which grew 9% year-over-year and were down 7% sequentially, compared to revenue growth of 44% year-over-year and 14% sequentially. Our cost structure, which includes cost of revenue and operating expenses, was $431 million, an increase of 15% year-over-year and a decrease of 4% sequentially. Q2 2018 adjusted EBITDA was negative $169 million, an improvement of 13% year-over-year and 22% sequentially. Adjusted EBITDA margin for Q2 2018 improved to negative 64% compared with negative 107% in Q2 2017 and negative 94% in Q1 2018. 
We are focused on creating long-term shareholder value and are optimistic about the long-term potential for scale and leverage in our business. We are investing in many innovation initiatives for our users, which we believe will enhance user experience and engagement as well as drive revenue growth. At the same time, we are executing on operating cost efficiency initiatives as we drive toward free cash flow generation and operating profitability over time. For the first time, we are providing quarterly financial guidance for revenue and adjusted EBITDA. We believe that sharing our thoughts on our near-term financial outputs will be helpful to investors and inform external expectations. The following forward-looking statements reflect our expectations as of August 7, 2018 and are subject to substantial uncertainty. As mentioned at the start of the call, our results are inherently unpredictable and may be materially affected by many factors. Now I will share our Q3 2018 outlook. Revenue is expected to be between $265 million and $290 million, or to grow between 27% and 39% year over year. Adjusted EBITDA is expected to be between negative $185 million and negative $160 million, compared to negative $179 million in Q3 2017. While we are not going to give DAU guidance, as a reminder, historically, Q3 DAU growth rates have trended down both year over year and sequentially compared with Q2. This guidance assumes, among other things, that no business acquisitions, investments, restructurings, or legal settlements are concluded in the quarter. And finally, I thought I'd also mention how glad I am that I joined SNAP. It's a great fit for me to be partnering with a leadership team that is so focused on the long term. There are many opportunities for us to drive growth initiatives and operational excellence over time. One learning since joining SNAP that enhanced my enthusiasm for our long-term opportunity is the reach of our global audience, which continued to grow and was higher than ever. In the U.S. and Canada, for example, we have over 100 million monthly active users, a noteworthy achievement for a company that is less than seven years old. I'm happy to introduce Kristen Southey, who recently joined SNAP as VP of Investor Relations. Some of you may already know her from her prior technology finance roles. I'd also like to thank Armand for leading investor relations for the last year. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be here, and I look forward to working with everyone. With that, let's open up the call for questions. That concludes the prepared remarks for today's earnings call, and we will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question. After your initial question is asked, your line will be muted. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. And our first question comes from Justin Post with Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you for taking my questions. I guess, to, um, Tim, first, since you've taken over, one of the one of the big questions for SNAP is is monetizing that large audience. And you mentioned you're pretty positive on what you see as the reach. Since you've been there, how, what's your enthusiasm for improving monetization of the audience? Do you think there's a ton of room there? And then secondly, on the financials, looks like pricing really is down significantly over the last two years. Do you think there is a bottom, and could that uh, help reaccelerate revenue growth when you get there? Thank you. Hey, Justin. Uh, yeah, as it relates to the uh, uh, monetization, um, you know, I think we see a lot of opportunities over time to monetize. You know, we're, right now we're focused on driving innovation initiatives for our users, uh, both uh, it will enhance user experience and engagement, and I think that will result in more monetization opportunities for us over time as well. As we think about monetization, we're looking at monetizing all aspects of the app as well. Uh, you know, not just the, uh, you know, whether it be communication, the camera, as well as Discover. So I think that presents a lot of opportunity for us over time. And as I said on the call, the size of our, and reach of our global audience uh, further reinforces that opportunity. As it relates to revenue growth and pricing, Imran, you want to take the pricing question? Yeah, I think the way we think about the business is showing our ad, uh, audience the right ad. Because when you show the most relevant ad to a consumer, it drives better experience for our users as well as better ROI for our advertisers. So we are continuously focused on delivering that, and when you do that and you bring in more lot advertisers, pricing takes care of it. But we are maniacally focused on continue to improve experience for both advertisers and our audience. 
And our next question comes from Stephen Jew with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. So, uh, Evan, uh, can you talk about the timeline of when you think your rebuilt Android app will be deployed more globally? And any views at this point in terms of how many Android users globally may have signed up and subsequently churned because the experience was so optimal? And I guess, uh, Tim or Imran, uh, your ROW revenue is up 65% sequentially, so wondering which country and or product you lit up to uh, drive the growth there. Thanks. Hey, Stephen, that's a, that's a great question. We're thinking a lot about how to re-engage the Android community and let them know about the changes that we're making to, to the Android application. Uh, right now, you know, we've been testing a lot internally. We're beginning to roll it out uh, in select markets uh, in beta, and we're going to continue to learn and test. We want to make sure that as we roll it out uh, that it's a really great experience for people uh, no matter what handset they're on. With, with regards to 65% uh, growth in the international market, we're, we're very pleased with that growth rate. I think... Uh, uh, one of the key things we were able to achieve through programmatic advertising is to roll out that sub-service uh, advertising buying experience to many countries. Uh, in addition to we have a strong audience in, 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 in countries like Australia. So, so we're very pleased with our growth rate. And our next question comes from Ross Sandler with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, two quick questions on the, on the guidance comments, uh, if I can. Uh, so first on the DAUs, you kind of say that the growth rates for both year-over-year year and Q-over-Q Q, uh, should decelerate. So I guess if we tee off on the Q-over-Q Q comment, that would get us something in the low 180s. Is that the right way to think about it? And then second on the revenue, um, 290 at the high end implies a slight decel from the 14% quarter-over-quarter uh, that you just posted in 2Q. So is there anything you would call out in 3Q that would – cause a deceleration given that you just had the uh, Olympics comp and given the momentum you're seeing in programmatic, you know, why wouldn't that kind of lift us to higher growth rates at some point? Anything you can flush out on, on that would be great. Sure. Thanks, Ross. On the DAU uh, comments in the, uh, in the guidance, I did say we're not going to be giving any DAU guidance, so there's not much more that I can add there. Uh, you know, I did point out historically we've seen a decline both year-over-year year and sequentially in the rate of growth, uh, but our expectations for DAU and MAU, for that matter, are incorporating our financial outlook uh, and the guidance we gave for revenue and EBITDA. As it relates to revenue, the revenue guidance, uh, the, we think the range of guidance we gave is appropriate, and 27% to 39% year-over-year growth is you know, strong revenue growth. Uh, some things to be mindful of as it relates to the revenue growth guidance, you know, pricing, you know, in the second quarter we saw 52% decline year over year in pricing, 9% quarter over quarter. And uh, you know, I think we're providing great value for our advertisers, with ROI, you know, with pricing decline and the overall experience and investing a lot in that area. Uh, but again, we think the range of guidance is appropriate and reflects strong growth. And our next question comes from Heath Terry with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Tim, I guess you, you talked about the, um, the the revenue side of things. Curious how, as you've um, uh, gotten settled in at, at Snap, uh, how you're thinking about the company's cost structure, um, particularly given your, your prior experience, the, um, uh, the the cloud costs and, and the cost of sort of serving the um, uh, the existing user base relative to um, to what you think might be optimal, and then. Um, Evan or, or, or Imran, realize you're not giving um, guidance on on DAUs, but to the extent that we're you know roughly halfway through the through the quarter, almost halfway through the quarter, um, any uh, uh, color you can give us on sort of what you're seeing in uh, in July and early August. This is Tim. I'll take the second question as well. Uh, we're not providing any further commentary on DAU expectations for the third quarter. It's reflected in the guidance. As it relates to the uh, the cost structure, I'm optimistic on the opportunities for uh, on the cost structure front as well as on you know, driving growth. Uh, you know, you, if you look at our infrastructure costs in the second quarter, uh, we saw an improvement in infrastructure costs per DAU. That's reflecting, as, as I mentioned on the call, the unit cost uh, economic improvements as well as operating engineering operating efficiencies that we're seeing. And that's something we're going to keep driving, as you can imagine, not only in the second quarter but persistently going forward. I think there's a great deal of opportunity there, again, not only to drive growth but also to drive uh, operating cost efficiency in the infrastructure side as well as in the, in the operating expenses. And we saw leverage 
in, uh, in operating expenses this quarter as well. And that certainly reflects the uh, headcount uh, reduction. We saw, you know, 100 head reduction from uh, Q1 to Q2, and we're down about 200 so far this year. But for the back half this year, we're going to be continuing to invest in innovation opportunities ahead of us, augmented reality and other areas, and expect our headcount to actually uh, be relatively consistent with the end of uh, 2017 as we invest in these growth initiative opportunities. So, you know, on EBITDA, you know, happy to see in the first time uh, in our history to, uh, improvement year over year in EBITDA uh, loss, and, uh, and for us to be talking about leverage. So I'm happy to be talking about 31% uh, leverage uh, that we saw in EBITDA with EBITDA improving uh, at a greater rate than uh, the change in revenue. So uh, I guess overall, it's, I'm optimistic for the opportunities ahead. And our next question comes from Mark Mahaney with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, let me try this. Uh, uh, Evan, you talked about, um, somebody already asked you about Android. Let me try to draw you a little, out a little bit more on that. How about this? When do you think the Android user experience, when would you like the Android user experience to match the iOS user experience? Like, in, in terms of the beta testing, is this like months? Is it quarters? Is it a year or two? And then, is there a drag in terms of the uh, Android experience for advertisers, um, you know, versus the, um, iOS experience for advertisers, is that something that needs to be fixed too or, or do they kind of fix whatever it is con contemporaneously or at the same time? Thanks, Evan. Yes, sure, Mark. So I think in terms of accessibility uh, of Snap worldwide and, and in particular with our Android product, there's sort of three components. I think, you know, the first one is obviously the application experience itself. It's something we're working really hard on and, you know, we're exciting to be, excited to be testing that uh, more widely, and, and the early results internally uh, have been very exciting. Um, I think, you know, another important piece of that is really the, the network speed and also the affordability of the network in these in these different countries. So I think hopefully as we tackle all three of those, uh, you know, through, through the end of this year and next year, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see uh, a better Android experience overall. With regards to advertising, as we improve the advertising uh, work, you know, we're going to continue to work on the client side to improve Android ad experience as well, and that's obviously a big opportunity to help the revenue growth going forward. Our next question is from John Egbert with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks. Um, I had a few questions regarding the SnapKit tools rolling out to developers. Uh, what are some of the biggest benefits you hope to see from allowing outside developers access to your audience? Uh, how do you think you approach these tools differently than some of your peers? And we'd love to hear um, some of the innovative ways you're seeing developers leverage these tools early on. I think uh, the thing we're most excited about is the way that it's empowering people to express themselves across uh, across a wide variety uh, wide variety of applications. So I think, for example, uh, you know, with Pandora being able to to stare, share uh, stickers of songs uh, on on snaps is, is really exciting, and then drives people to to check out the music. I think another thing we've seen uh, is really the expressive power of Bitmoji, um, which people are linking to applications and using uh, in the form of stickers as a, as a way to communicate, not just in Snapchat but in, in other uh, applications and services. And lastly, I think as we approach uh, you know, SnapKit, I think one of the things we are really excited about is that the trust we built uh, with our community in terms of the way that we respect privacy, I think, it, you know, is being appreciated, and that makes people more likely uh, to, want to, to want to use SnapKit because they, they trust that uh, we'll protect their information. And I think we've worked really hard to, to make sure that if you use SnapKit to, to log in with other services, um, that, uh, that we'll do a good job safeguarding uh, your identity and, and information. And our next question comes from Eric Sheridan with UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the question. Maybe two if I can around the advertising business. With the 75% of revenue now going programmatic, is there a mix we think uh, we should be thinking about you trying to get to over the medium to long term of how much of the business is programmatic versus direct uh, and what might some of the impacts might be for the cost structure of the business as, as that evolves? And then one follow-up, as you move the creative tools to programmatic, is there any way to frame whether that creates headwinds on pricing as we go through 18 and 19? Thanks, everyone. Yeah, with regards to uh, percentage of programmatic, so I think, you know, long-term our vision is to everybody should be able to buy advertising on a platform through self-service platform, and that is the most frictionless way for people to enjoy buying ad buying experience. Uh, with regards to how does that impact cost, even with a self-service platform and a programmatic advertising platform, you need to have a self-organization who are consultative, 
to educate the market what's the best practices and we're going to continue to innovate on our advertising product uh, and our platforms so that advertising world can understand this product so we will continue to invest in our sales organization despite we automate the ad buying process and and and, and ad delivery process uh, with regards to uh, creative tools transition you know uh, transition creative tools are a smaller percentage of our revenue as opposed to our snap ad revenue and uh, also we, we have been very thoughtful how we are transitioning the creative tools business to uh, to uh, uh, to programmatic you are you saw some you know uh, impact of that that's negatively impacted the growth rate this quarter and it's already baked into team's guidance as well our next question comes from Lloyd Walmsley with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, one for Evan and, and maybe one for Imran. Um, Evan, at, at just a high level, aside from fixing the Android app, what, what do you think you guys need to do to reignite user growth? And I guess do you even need strong user growth to, to build a large and profitable ad business? And then uh, for, for Imran, can you give us a sense of the mix of ad revenue between you know, big brand advertisers and DR advertisers. You know, you talked a lot about improvements on the ad tech side. So wondering, you know, what are some of the key challenges for scaling the DR side? You know, is it more features, more sales, and, and kind of what are you doing to, to drive that shift? Thanks. Hi, Lloyd. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, as we look uh, forward at user growth and, and our opportunity, I, th I think, you know, we talked a little bit today about, you know, over 100 million uh, monthly active users in the U.S. and Canada, in Canada, which, uh, you know, is a very significant scale, obviously, for, for businesses as young as ours. So that's something we're really excited about. And I think, you know, what, what we're seeing on the engagement side over 30 minutes a day also represents significant uh, opportunity for us. So I think, you know, as we go forward, obviously, DA is something we're very focused on over the past you know, year, 18 months, we, we've, you know, primarily focused uh, on, on the, the core product, you know, obviously improving um, the, the user experience by allowing people to explore a lot more content. So we think that there's a lot of uh, upside there with the redesigned uh, Discover platform. And as we work through some of these issues we saw, you know, especially with the communication side of the product, you know, we think there's a lot of opportunity to help people understand uh, the value of Snap. So I, I think, you know, given uh, given the progress we've made in, in a pretty short amount of time, uh, we're really excited about uh, the opportunity and, and really the, the widespread appeal of Snap. Yeah, and maybe add a little bit to Evans and then answer your second question. You know, I think when I talk to advertisers, they really appreciate our large audience in the developed market where purchasing power is big and advertising market is big and also our millennial audience, that the penetration we have among the millennial audience, which is very, very difficult to reach in traditional media. So, so we think that is uh, very, very appreciative. With regards to DR business, you know, our direct response business is doing incredibly well and I'm, I couldn't be more happy with it. You know, primarily when you put things in a perspective that we launched our ad manager June of last year. So the kind of progress we're seeing, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. And we're making a lot of uh, uh, improvements. So, for example, uh, our new few several new updates are objective-based buying where we want to help solve business objectives and we have continued to make progress in our transition from product-based buying to objective-based buying. Uh, we now have nine different objectives to choose from, including driving and optimizing web conversion. So let me give you an example. Uh, there's this uh, e-commerce company named Your Shop. Uh, Your Shop they wanted to leverage our unique appeal to millennial audience, and they found great success. You know, they drove 40% of your shop's total installs from Snapchat, and at a 50% higher return on investment than what they were getting from other digital channels. So we couldn't be very uh, more pleased to help all these small businesses to succeed on our platform and help them grow their business. Our next question is from Mark May with City. Please go ahead. Mark, your line is live. You may proceed with your question. Thanks. A couple more on the ad business, please. Um, with the significant increase in ad impressions recently, can you talk about where you are from an ad load perspective and if we should think of, ad, of impression growth going forward being driven, you know, more by user and time spent growth, or do you still have, you know, headroom uh, with load and, and sell-through? And then um, maybe separately, can you just talk about trends and user engagement with ads, uh, maybe, you know, including view time, trends, and, and click-through rates? Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, we, Mark, we really focus on 
showing the most relevant ads to the most relevant users. Because even if I show you one ad that is completely annoying, that reduces your user experience. And if I show you five really good, great ads that you are engaging with them, that drives better user experience. So I think the best way to think about the ad load is, are you doing a right work on the ranking side? Are you doing a right work by bringing a lot more advertisers on the platform so that I, we can show you the most relevant ad all the time? And, and that's what we're working on, and that's, I think we're making good progress uh, and delivering better ROI. And I'll give you an example. Like, you know, Domino's you know, has been a great partner with us, and they recently enabled conversion lift studies with us, and, uh, and they were one of the initial partners. And they have run three successful lift studies to date, achieving higher purchase lift in each subsequent test of their Snap ad campaigns because, you know, we're trying to deliver the right ad to the right people. Uh, in terms of ad engagement, again, going back to the right point, it's, it's a ranking problem and we're working really, really hard to w improving on that and our, the team is doing a really good job on that. Our next question comes from Jason Helstein with Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the things we focused on last quarter that came out was that um, ad agencies were, had kind of gotten frustrated with the platform and, and, and some of the headlines around the platform. Um, you know, obviously the numbers speak for themselves, but can you give us just some more color on, you know, how you're working with the agencies and do, we, do you feel like, in your opinion, we've kind of crossed over and at this point now you're getting less product questions from them and it's really more about kind of the whole ROI discussion and, and, and what you can bring to the table there, thanks. Yeah, you know, I think with our, you know, attractive pricing, you know, it gives an, and, and low density in auction compared to other platforms, gives an incredible opportunity for advertisers to come and win on our platform, you know. And one of the trends we have seen that with the headline risk, some of the advertisers who were looking for flashy things, yes, they were not necessarily engaged in Q1, but the advertisers who stayed with us, they have been very, very engaged and have some uh, have seen very good success and and increased their budget with us. So we're we're really excited about that. Uh, and, and 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 in fact, today in my monetization staff meeting, we're talking about how we're seeing success with the CPG customers. One CPG customer increasing their budget significantly because they're seeing good ROI. So so I, I couldn't be more happy with it. You know, engaging with advertisers and focusing on ROI and driving value for them. Our next question comes from Doug Amuth with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the question. Um, just one advertising. Uh, can you just talk a little bit more about the improvements in the ad targeting and measurement side, some of the things you're doing well, and also where you think you still have challenges? Uh, and then, Tim, if you could, um, any comments on the linearity of DAUs during 2Q uh, or any quantification on the uh, World Cup ad dollars that you may have received during the quarter? Thanks. Yeah, I think, do you want to take the second question first? Yeah, like, as, as it relates to DAUs during the quarter, we're not going to be commenting on intra-quarter behavior on the DAU front. Um, beyond you know, beyond the, the comments you made on, on DAUs, you know, up 8% year over year and monthly active up uh, to our highest uh, rate ever. Yeah, and with regards to uh, targeting, we continue to make a pretty significant progress, you know, from custom audience to building, uh, uh, targeting uh, capabilities based on users' interest. You know, one in recent example is we extended our partnership with Nielsen and now offering advertisers the ability to reach audiences based on actual purchase data. Advertisers can currently leverage over 1,000 different segments for targeting with thousands more coming. So, uh, so we are really, really excited. Like one give example is uh, advertisers can target their Snapchat campaign to people who purchase lipstick at a retail store. So we can get to that kind of level of the granularity. So we're very, very excited about it. Uh, with regards to one of the ch uh, uh, challenges that you talked about, it, look, I think we, I'll put it as an opportunity is the pixel. You know, we continue, we rolled the pixel, pixel recently and we continue to make good progress. For example, we saw over 85% growth quarter over quarter in the number of advertisers actively spending ad accounts using their pixel. And, uh, and they're getting good traction. So one of the uh, men's grooming, uh, direct-to-consumer grooming and lifestyle company called Manscaped, uh, they wanted to drive new customer acquisitions at scale, and they leverage our pixel uh, to provide real-time performance results, which allowed them to easily see which ads were driving the most conversion at or below its cost per acquisition target. And uh, with that, they saw very good results. For example, uh, the addition of Snapchat to their media mix model allowed the company to grow revenue by 17 percentage point in just two months. 
and Snapchatters also provided to be high value customers with an average order value that is 20% higher than user acquired on other platforms. So we're very excited. Again, our goal is to drive ROI, drive value to the advertisers at a very attractive price so that they can win on our platform and creating a win-win situation. Thanks. And then following up on your question on World Cup, uh, yeah, major events like World Cup and Olympics last quarter are more engagement drivers for us, primarily on the communication front. Uh, you had 80 million people watching World Cup content on Snap, for example. But as far as the, uh, revenue is concerned, the major events provide a modest revenue impact that's less impactful as we scale over time and currently at, at our current scale as well. And also be mindful of the fact that as we have evolved to be much more programmatic, it's always on and there's a less of an event-based as it was a direct response historically. But uh, as related to the second quarter impact for World Cup, again, that would also be reflected not only in our results, but in our guidance expectations for Q3. Our next question comes from Brian Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, it's actually uh, Alex Long on from Brian. Thanks for uh, taking the question. Uh, making the preparative remarks, you highlighted um, drivers of ad revenue, including SMBs and international. I think you touched on self-serve in, in Australia as, as helping international, but i uh, wondering if you can parse out some of the trends you're seeing for SMBs and anything incremental on the international front. Uh, and then yeah. second, as the company continues to focus on operational efficiencies, how do you think about balancing growth versus investment and uh, incremental margin trends as uh, we head into 2019? Thanks. So with regards to SMB, our SMB business, also known as Global Online Solution Business, has been really, uh, really well, and uh, we're uh, super excited about it. That business is growing at a very healthy pace. They're onboarding a lot more advertisers on the platform, and and uh, so, uh, so so we're excited, and the trend we're seeing uh, across the world uh, on that group and and and, and with the run by a strong leadership team. So uh, so we're super excited, and 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 I think nothing beyond to say at this point. As it relates to your second question, you know, I think we're optimistic about the long-term potential for scale in the business. When we think about, you know, whether it's not an either-or, it's growth and operating efficiencies, and that's not just now, but over the long term as well. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, we talked about in the second quarter driving operating efficiencies in infrastructure as well as operating cost structure, and additionally saw 48% year-over-year growth in revenue. So this is the focus on both growth and operational efficiency improvements as you drive toward free cash flow generation and operating profitability over time. And uh, that's the focus for us, not just today, but over the long term. Our next question comes from Anthony DiClemente with Evercore. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much for taking my questions. Um, Tim, in your remarks, you talked about operating cost efficiencies. Um, I wanted to ask, in the, in the SNAP filings, there are minimum hosting cost commitments that, uh, that are disclosed that go out over the next several years. Uh, do your comments suggest that there's, there's a way or a chance that, that SNAP wouldn't ultimately perhaps spend at the, at the minimum levels disclosed in, in those filings on the, uh, on the hosting, uh, minimum hosting costs? And then, and then also, I guess, related to, to your filings, I think, I think you normally give snaps per day. Um, uh, that was disclosed in, in, in the first quarter. Uh, can, you, can you give that to us, what were, were snaps per day in the Q2, please? Thank you very much. Uh, so as relates to the, I'll take the, the cloud uh, partner comment first. Um, I mean, you know, we're constantly in, in dialogue with our cloud partners on optimizing our utilization of services over time. And as, as I said on the call, we're driving you know, not only unit cost of economic improvements as well as operating, engineering operating efficiency improvements. But we're comfortable with the current agreements with our cloud partners and comfortable, comfortable with our current cloud strategy. In terms of snaps per day, we saw over uh, 3 billion snaps uh, per day in a quarter. Our next question comes from Rich Greenfield with BTIG. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking the question. I wanted to follow up. You know, in the prepared remarks, Evan, I think you talked about the fact that publisher stories or shows that um, basically daily viewership of those products was up about 15% year over year. I was wondering, if you, could you give us some color on what's actually happening with friend stories, which I think is a much bigger use case. Is that, you know, are, are, is the daily usage of friend stories, both creation and consumption, is that up or down year over year? How does that track and how does that look? And then kind of just curious intellectually as you look across the whole platform, 
what percentage of your DAUs, if you look at global DAUs, what percentage of people are actually using anything on the right side, whether it be a, a friend story, a publisher story, or a show? How many people actually touch one of those things on a daily basis? Thanks. Hey, Rich. Uh, those are great questions. I'm not sure we disclose the exact numbers. You know, you're right to point out the importance of friend stories, and that's why we're so focused on keeping that close friend network so that people feel comfortable expressing themselves. And we've really seen a lot of success with our creative tools, which, you know, really uh, empower that expression. So we're, we're very focused uh, on friend stories, and I think one of the great things we've seen uh, with Discover is separating out friend stories uh, rather than mixing them in with all sorts of other content uh, makes them easier to find. And so having them at the top of the Discover page, we think, uh, you know, is, is a really important thing for the long term uh, of the business. Our next question comes from Yusuf Squally with SunTrust. Please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Um, first of all, Tim, thanks for the guidance. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, and then, Evan, maybe these are two questions for you. Um, you spoke about users' uh, engagement on the platform, I think, 30 minutes per day on a daily basis. How has that metric trend over the last couple of years, and just how important is it um, for you guys to keep hitting your numbers and maybe hopefully continue to grow very fast without necessarily seeing a growth in that metric? And lastly, in terms of new user retention, uh, for people older than 35, I think, you guys talked about plus 8%. What about younger audiences? What are you seeing there? Thank you. Yeah, so in, in terms of uh, time spent, I think we've pretty consistently been disclosing uh, 30 minute, over 30 minutes uh, per day. Uh, you know, one of the things that we think about a lot uh, when we look at Discover in particular um, you know, is really trying to make sure that people can find the, the right content. And so, you know, I think one of the most important things about the redesign is that we're surfacing the right content to the right people as quickly as possible so that when they uh, go over that page, they can dive right in uh, to content. So that's sort of how we're thinking about uh, time spent there. Um, and then, Tim, do you want to? Anything else to add? And our next question comes from Peter Stabler with Wells Fargo Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. A couple on ARPU, if, if I could. Um, is it right to assume that the transition to programmatic started first and was most aggressive in North America? And related to that, as we start lapping the fast adoption of programmatic, could investors expect ARPU in the U.S. to, to reaccelerate? And if so, would that be would that be faster than we see uh, internationally? And um, I guess that's it for me. Thanks. Yeah, I think well, with regards to um, ARPU, you know, I think many of the international market, we started the business programmatic directly, right? Uh, I think in the U.S., our advertising business is more mature, and we had uh, this insertion order-based buying process. Uh, with regards to, you know, ARPU, we don't give ARPU guidance, but I think one of the key things is that we are really excited about the potential for our domestic U.S. business. Uh, we have more than 100 million monthly users in U.S. and Canada, which is a very large audience base in a, one of the largest ad market in the world. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities to onboard a lot more advertisers. There's a lot of opportunities to go deep into a lot of advertisers. And uh, so I think I'm, I'm really, really excited about our uh, U.S. business and the domestic business, our North America business. But beyond that, I can kind of give you a specific ARPU guidance. And again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then one. Our next question comes from Brian Fitzgerald with Jefferies. Please go ahead. Thanks, guys. Maybe as a follow-up to Eric's question, as, as you left the rollout of the self-serve platform, can you talk a bit about what you're seeing with respect to the auction dynamics? Are the majority of these auctions competitive at this point, and, and what does pricing look like there? Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, more and more auctions are uh, becoming competitive, uh, and I think you know uh, we're bringing a lot more advertisers on the platform. Uh, so I think uh, beyond that, we're not at this point breaking down what what's that doing to the pricing. Again, I think it's really important. We're really focused on delivering the great ROI to the advertisers and showing the most relevant ad to our consumer, uh, because we think if we do that in the long term, that takes care of the business. Our next question comes from Brian Weiser with Pivotal Research. Please go ahead. 
Thanks for taking the question. I, I was wondering if you could talk about whether or not uh, the uh, what Twitter's described as the, the China export market uh, might be contributing. And uh, also, uh, did you see any impact from GDPR uh, one way or the other? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think with regards to GDPR, we're very happy with our international growth, uh, international revenue growth of the business. It grew at a very healthy clip and couldn't be more happier. In fact, in terms of GDPR impact, we have not seen any material impact that I can discuss during the uh, this call for in Q2. Uh, however, it's still early and we are monitoring the situation very, very closely. Uh, with regards to China, you know, I think China is a very interesting market. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, companies uh, who are looking for global traffic and, and, and Snap offers a very attractive audience at a, uh, in a developed market that could be very valuable to uh, help those businesses grow. And uh, uh, I was recently in China uh, meeting with advertisers and 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 and, 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 and Last uh, uh, last week. Uh, however, we're not breaking down what's the revenue contribution from that market at this point. And our next question comes from James Lee with Mizuho Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, Follow-up question on ARPU. I realized that your rest of the world ARPU is actually higher than Europe. I was wondering, is that sustainable? And when I look at Facebook's uh, APAC and rest of the world ARPU, it's only 25% Europe. And to help us understand why they are able to monetize so well. Thanks. Yeah, I think, again, we're not going to give ARPU guidance, but a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, if you look at uh, our audience in the rest of the world, is coming from a market that is more monetizable, like Australia or Middle East. And, uh, and, and I think also our audience is uh, a more millennial audience, uh, which is also very, very attractive to a lot of advertisers. And so I think in terms of guidance, we cannot provide, but, you know, I think we are very, very excited about the demographic uh, audience we have. And as the audience grow from ver various markets, we'll see how the R2 trends. But, you know, we are really focused on driving overall revenue growth rather than on any specific region's R2. And this concludes our question and answer session, as well as Snap Inc.'s second quarter 2018 earnings conference call. Thank you for attending today's session, and you may now disconnect your lines.